Hey guys, welcome back to another CXC revision session. I'm your host, Ms. Baikem. So today we'll be reviewing part two of the May June 2017 CXC Human and Social Biology Pass paper. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I want to welcome back all our returning subscribers. And if you're a new subscriber, we're glad to have you here. Let us continue. Question 31. Items 31 refers to the following diagram of a human brain. The question, which part of the brain is responsible for our conscious thought? So we have A, cerebrum, B, cerebellum, C, hypothalamus, D, medulla oblongata. So the medulla oblongata is going to control involuntary muscular action such as heartbeat, breathing, swallowing, peristalsis, and blood pressure. So that's out of it. So C, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to control the body internal temperature, homeostasis. So C is also out of it. So now we're stuck with A and B. Is it going to be the cerebrum or the cerebellum? So the cerebellum, now it's going to control balance by coordinating muscular activity. So now we know that the cerebellum is out. So the cerebrum, it deals with intellectual thoughts. So it's the intellectual area. It deals with thoughts your speech, all of those stuff happens in the cerebrum. Question 32. Which of the following is an involuntary action? So is it eating, walking, breathing, riding a bicycle? Remember, we said that the medulla oblongata deals with involuntary action. I listed some examples before. And if you were listening keenly, you would have realized that breathing was one of the examples that was listed. So breathing is involuntary. We, we don't tell ourselves to breathe. And that's why it's not a conscious thought. You cannot just say, you know, self breathe. We don't do that. Eating, yes, you can tell yourself you're hungry, you need to eat. Walking is the same thing. You're going on a walk, riding your bicycle. You tell yourself, you know, I need to go for a ride on my bicycle. So breathing is the only thing that you do without even telling yourself to do that. That's why it's involuntary. Question 33. Which of the following occurs to bring about accommodation in the eye? Accommodation happens when the lens are focusing on near and distant objects. So it's the adjustment of the lens to focus on near and distant object, rather. So we have A, tightening of the suspensory ligament through relaxation of the ciliary muscle. B, loosening of the suspensory ligament through relaxation of the ciliary muscle. C, tightening of the suspensory ligament with no change in the ciliary muscle. D, loosening of the suspensory ligament with no change in the ciliary muscle. So remember, accommodation is how the eye would adjust to seeing near and distant object. So whenever we're trying to focus on distant object now, the ciliary muscle will relax. So the only two that speaks about the ciliary muscle relaxing is A, and B. So the next thing that happens when we're focusing on distant object is that the fact that the ciliary muscles are relaxed is gonna pull on the, sus the suspensory ligament, which will cause the suspensory ligament to become tight. And this is gonna make the lens flatten or less convex. And looking at this, A would have been the perfect answer because the suspensory ligament in A is tightening. And this is what happens whenever we're trying to see a distant object. But if we we're trying to see a near object now, the opposite would happen. So the ciliary muscle now will contract. And because the ciliary muscle is contracting, then it's gonna reduce the tension on the suspensory ligament and they'll slacken or the suspensory ligament will loosen while the ciliary muscle contract. And that would have been if we're trying to view a near object. So moving on, 34. 
Item 34 refers to the following diagram showing some of the organs in the body which produce hormones. So it's just a basic diagram of the hormone, the endocrine system. So which hormone is secreted by the organ? S. So let us try to label. So at the top here, we'll have the thyroid glands because it's in the throat region. Then S here would be the pancreas. And then right here would be the adrenal gland. And then right here would be either the testes or the ovaries. So the testes are the ovaries. And as we can see, S was labeled where the pancreas is. So because it's the pancreas, so is it A, adrenaline? No, adrenaline is produced by the adrenal gland. B, taroxine. Taroxine is produced by the thyroid gland. C, oestrogen. Oestrogen is produced by the ovaries. So it will be produced here where we have the testes and the ovaries. So the answer is D, insulin. Because the pancreas secretes insulin. So the hormone that is produced there has to be insulin as the pancreas secretes insulin. So moving on. Which of the following comparisons is not true for nervous and hormonal control? So we have a for nervous, electrical messages travel along neurons. So we're looking for something that is not true, that is true. Then messages are transported in the blood. That is definitely true for hormonal control. B, chemical messages travel across synapses. That is true. Only chemical messages are involved. That is also true. So C, the, re the response is usually short-lived, true, and then the effects are often long-lasting, which is true. So D, messages travel slowly and take longer to have an effect that is incorrect. So for nervous control, the messages, don't, they, are, they, are, they travel in a short period, a short amount of time. But if it was the hormonal, no, the hormonal messages, they take a longer period of time to travel for a change to happen. So it, they, because they're traveling in the blood, and remember the blood has so many other components in it, it takes a longer time for them to reach the organs that they need to send that message to. And we're talking about hormonal control. But for the nervous control, no, it's a short period, it's quick. So that's why D is incorrect. Question 37. Item 37 refers to the following diagram, which represents the front view of the male reproductive system. So this is the diagram. So which of the following correctly identifies the structure as labeled one, two, three, and four? So now if we're looking at it, so one is coming from the epididymis, which is attached to the testes, so one has to be the vas deferens or the sperm duct. So one is the sperm duct. All right. Then two is attached or it's in the penis. So two has to be the urethra. 
urethra so the urethra that's two and then three three is gonna be the prostate gland and then four is definitely the seminal vesicles so one is the sperm duct so the only two that has one as the sperm duct is a and c and then two is the urethra yes looking like c three is the prostate gland and then four is the seminal vesicle so the answer here is c so item 38 refers to the following diagram which shows the human spermatozoa or the human sperm cells so which of the labeled parts contains mitochondria so is it a b c or d so a is the tail so that's out of it it doesn't contain any mitochondria b is the middle piece and it is used for energy supply so guess what it does contain mitochondria c is the nucleus so the nucleus is the brain so it doesn't have any mitochondria and then D is something called acrosome, which is going to secrete enzymes to penetrate the egg. So that's the function of this top part. The acrosome is going to secrete an enzyme so that the sperm can penetrate the egg whenever it meets an egg. So the best option would have been B. 39. Item 39 refers to the following graph which shows the level of oestrogen during the menstrual cycle so the oestrogen level is highest so we have oestrogen so it's highest right here day 14 which day 14 is when ovulation happens so the oestrogen level is highest here because ovulation which is the release of an egg happens the 14th day of the menstrual cycle so that's why even without reading the options i knew that so the answer has to be a so just to make sure let us read to the other options b with a fully built up uterine wall no it's not fully built up c at the shedding of the youth of the uterine wall that happens day one to five that's where the shedding starts and then during the build up of the uterine wall that's not the best option so the best option at day 14 right here when it's the highest that's when ovulation happens so an egg is released from the ovaries then 40 which of the following contraceptive methods prevents the egg from being implanted in the uterus so we have a condom so condom is definitely out of it because condom is a rubber sheet that is placed over the erect penis before intercourse so it, it doesn't go anywhere near the uterus so the diaphragm the diaphragm is also out of it so the diaphragm or the cervical cap is definitely out of it because it's also a rubber sheet but it has a dome shape and then we insert it in the top of the vagina before intercourse still don't go nowhere near the uterus so it's out of it so the intrauterine device no this is the one so the intrauterine device or iud or coil is a metal or plastic loop inserted into the uterus by a doctor and it's going to prevent implantation so it goes inside the uterus so it's a surgical process and then the spermicidal or the foam so the spermicide is inserted into the vagina before intercourse to kill to kill the sperm so that's definitely out of it also so we're still stuck with c 41 ovulation is the process by which remember we spoke about it before if you were listening you would have remembered when i said ovulation it happens the 14th day in the cycle and this is when an egg is released from the ovaries a mature egg is released from the ovaries so now we have a 
females become pregnant, so that's out of it. B, a male and a female gamete fuse, that's fertilization, that's not ovulation. C, an egg is implanted in the uterus, that's implantation, that's not ovulation. And then D, a mature egg is released into the overduct, definitely ovulation. So 42, in a multicellular organism, whenever cells need to be replaced, cells divide by, so we have A, meiosis, B, fission, C, mitosis, D, fertilization. The answer is definitely mitosis. Just remember, mitosis happens in all the cells in the body except the sex cells. And mitosis is when the cells are going to divide to give us new cells. And it does not happen in the reproductive cells or the sex cells or the sex gametes because that is meiosis. So the only one here that would help our cells to divide whenever they need to be replaced is mitosis. 43. Chromosomes are made up of proteins and A, DNA, B, RNA, C, starch, D, fat. So we already know that starch and fat are out of it because they don't make up our chromosomes. So we're still between DNA and RNA. So chromosomes are mainly made up of DNA. If you think about human's DNA. So, so it's protein and DNA. You may see something called histones and DNA, histones are proteins. So it's the same thing as saying protein and DNA are histones and DNA. Look out for that term. So it's H-I-S-T-O-N-E-S, histones. Question 44. Which of the following is an example of genetic engineering? So we have A, using stem cells to produce organs. B, tissue culture in banana production. C, cloning of high producing animals. D, production of insulin by E. coli bacteria or Escherichia coli bacteria. So the best option here would have been D, production of insulin by E. coli bacteria. So please remember that genetic engineering involves altering or manipulating genes Example, by transferring genes from one organism into another, rapidly dividing organisms such as a bacteria, the organism can be made to produce a variety of important chemical substances such as hormones, antibiotics, vitamins, and enzymes. The insulin is produced by transferring the human insulin gene into a bacteria. Could not say that any better so now that's why d would have been the best example so to get insulin we have to put it in a bacteria and it is because of genetic engineering so that desired quality that we need the insulin we try to make more of it because bacteria as they rapidly divide they divide fast and hence we would have more insulin 45 which of the following cannot be prevented by healthy lifestyle activities? So we have A, influenza, which is like a common cold, B, sickle cell anemia, C, iron deficiency anemia, D, chronic heart disease. So the only thing here that cannot be prevented by lifestyle is sickle cell anemia because this one is hereditary. It's genetic, so it comes from the genes it's it's inherited you get it from a parent so that's why it's it cannot be cured it cannot be prevented by lifestyle changes influenza can it's a cold ensure that you're having your, a lot of vitamin c iron deficiency take your iron eat more food that contain iron chronic heart attack or heart disease so this can be prevented if you're eating healthier, having a balance that you're exercising, definitely, but not sickle cell anemia. So 46, SEMA has the following signs slash symptoms, constriction of the bronchial tubes, coughing, wheezing. She's most likely suffering from, so we have A, asthma, B, malaria, C, typhoid, D, tuberculosis. So the best options for this one is definitely 
asthma because we know people who, are, who have asthma. We know that they're always coughing whenever it gets bad. They're wheezing. And one of the reasons is because their bronchial tubes in which they get air, they get oxygen. Guess what? It's constricting, it's tightening, and hence why they can't breathe and they have to be wheezing. It's not malaria. We get malaria from mosquitoes. It's not typhoid either. And it's definitely not tuberculosis. And 47. Hypertension does not occur as a result of. So we have A, obesity. B, anemia, C, arteriosclerosis, D, high cholesterol level. So please remember, hypertension is high blood pressure. So A, so we're trying to figure out which would cause hypertension also. So obesity, definitely will cause high blood pressure because obesity is happening when the person body is overweight so they are eating excess amount of food and it can result in hypertension especially if they're eating foods that will result in hypertension that would increase the blood pressure so that's all of it B, anemia. So anemia is inherited or it's a deficiency in iron. So that won't result in the blood pressure going up because remember in anemia, we have a low blood count, meaning that the persons don't have a, a lot of red blood cells or hemoglobin that should be in the red blood cell. Hence, they don't have a lot of red blood cells. So that's one of the reasons why anemia is the best option here. So arteriosclerosis, this happens when the vessels that is going to carry the blood that has oxygen and nutrients, which is the arteries, become thick and stiff. Hence, they're going to restrict blood flow. And this can cause hypertension because if it's constricting to restrict blood flow, then guess what? There's going to be a pressure, a built up. So a pressure will be there. Hence, hypertension, high blood pressure. The high cholesterol levels definitely increases the blood pressure. 48. Which of the following statements about herpes is true? So A, herp herpes is caused by a bacteria. B, herpes does not affect fertility. C, there is no complete cure for herpes. D, the newborn child of a herpes sufferer cannot be infected so the only thing here that is true is c because herpes is spread from skin to skin contact with infected areas during vaginal sex oral sex and also kissing herpes comes from the infection of the herpes simplex virus of the genitals so it's not about serious a virus and it does affect fertility. And if it's passed on via the sex organs, then guess what? A newborn baby can become infected if the mother has herpes during birth. So this one is definitely out also. This is out because it's caused by a virus and it does affect fertility. So the best option here would have been C. 49. Which of the following symptoms causes the most injury to a person suffering from dengue fever? So we have A, muscle pain, B, arching or aching joints rather, C, abdominal pain, D, hemorrhaging of internal organs. So for dengue fever, all of the following happen, but the most injury will come from whenever the organs start to hemorrhage. 
and then 50. In order to purify water from a well for drinking, it is best to, so we have A, pasteurize it, B, boil it to 100 degrees, C, boil it under pressure, D, subject it to ultra high temperatures. So all of these answers sounds interesting, but the best answer is the simplest one, which we know from, from primary school, I would assume, boil it to 100 degrees. So pasteurization is mainly used when we're trying to make milk. So we're trying to preserve milk. That's when we use pasteurization. So that's out of it. See, boil it under pressure. It's still a part of the pasteurization process. And no. So we boil it under pressure to sterilize the materials that we're using, the non-living materials. So that is what happens. If you want to sterilize some non-living materials, maybe some plastic, we'd boil it under, our glass would boil it under pressure. We're thinking about glass bottles when we are recycling. Then D, sub subject it to ultra high temperatures. So this is also a part of the pasteurization process in which we do it because some spores some organisms they can survive at at the temperatures that we normally use it to pasteurize it so now we do this to just get rid of whatever has survived because some spores become inactivate at high temperature So that means that some spores, they stop work at high temperature. So they become inactive at high temperature. So 51. Item 51 refers to the following diagram showing the life cycle of a host fly. So which stage is prevented by keeping the host hole refuse properly covered? So the answer is definitely B. So keeping the whole soul refuse covered in B will definitely prevent the mosquitoes from breathing because this is where they, you know, they lay their eggs, they breathe, basically. Fifty-two. What type of immunity is acquired when antibodies are produced when a vaccine is administered? So we're talking about the immunity that is produced when antibodies are produced because a vaccine was given. So we have A, artificial active acquired, B, artificial passive, C, natural acquired, D, natural passive. So the best option here is artificially because we get it right it was administered and it's active because it's a vaccine and we are we have acquired it so it's a artificially active it's not natural acquired we did not get we did not develop it on our own we got a little help so c and d is out of it and it's not passive because it's a vaccine so we would have some a lower dose of the vaccine or the dead strain of the vaccine so 53 item 53 refers to the following graph what inference can be drawn from the graph above so if we look at the graph we have numbers we have time so we have the rat population human leptospirosis cases so what can we draw? So we have A, rats suffer from leptospirosis. No, that's not the case. Remember the rat is the one that has the disease and they transfer it. B, leptospirosis is always on the increase. No, because it started to decrease here. Then C, humans may cause leptospirosis in rats. No, we all know that's not true. 
So the rats may cause leptospirosis in humans, that's true, because as you can see, whenever the leptospirosis population was increasing, you realize that the amount of humans that had it was also increasing. And then whenever the, the, the rat population decreased, you realize that the leptospirosis cases decreased. So 54, water pollution could be controlled by a public education and laws b pouring sewage into rivers after bacterial decomposition c using nitrate fertilizers on crops planted near rivers d washing in rivers using detergent containing phosphate so the only thing here that will control water pollution is public education and laws b if you pour sewage into the river that's not gonna control pollution water pollution and then see if you're using fertilizers remember fertilizers contaminate the rivers and cause a lot of algae to grow and the washing in the rivers is the same thing it's going to cause algae to grow there and kill off some of the aquatic organisms that are in the water question 55 the process by which water vapor changes to water is known as, so we have A, evaporation, B, sublimation, C, condensation, D, solidification. So the answer is definitely condensation. So that is the process in which water vapor our gas is going to change to a liquid so water vapor changes to water so now evaporation happens when water converts itself to water vapor so from liquid to gas sublimation happens where gases move directly into its solid state and they don't enter their liquid state and then solidification as the name suggests is when liquids move into their solid state it becomes a solid hence the term solidification 56 Chlorine bleach can be added to drinking water to A. Improve the taste B. Prepare it for filtration C. Remove unpleasant smells and D. Destroy microorganisms So the best option here is to destroy the microorganisms that might be in the water 57 which of the following is the correct sequence for testing water for bacteria? So we have I, examine the agar in the petri dish for the presence of coliform colonies. To incubate the petri dish at 35 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. Three, place collected water in a sterile bottle. IV, pour the water onto a sterile agar in the petri dish. In a sterile petri dish so the best option would have been three first so you have to collect the water and then you're gonna put it in a sterile container so pour now pour the water into the sterile agar you have to do that you have to put it in the agar and then the next thing would have been two you have to incubate the petri dish at 35 degrees for 24 hours and then the last thing you need to do is you're gonna examine the presence for the coliform on the petri dish so the answer here is c because it starts with three and then it's iv two then one 58 which of the following are effects of releasing untreated sewage into the rivers and lakes so i increase in bacteria two decreasing oxygen three death of fishes so if we're releasing sewage into rivers and lakes, so there's gonna be an increase in bacteria there. The sum of the fishes are gonna die, hence we're gonna have decrease in oxygen. So all of them would have been an effect. 
59. Which of the following gases is produced in a landfill site? So we have ozone, steam, oxygen, and methane. So the best option here would have been methane. Question 60. A substance is biodegradable if it A can be broken down by bacteria to harmless materials, B cannot be broken down by bacteria to harmless materials, C is broken down by sunlight to harmless materials, D is broken down by chemicals to harmless materials. So the best option here is A can be broken down by bacteria to harmless materials. So we're once again at the end of another video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and also turn on your notification bell so you know whenever we post a video. See you next time when we review another session. I'm your host, Ms. Bayer Kim.